Hey everyone, this is Dr. Drizzle and welcome to the National Parks Expedition Challenge. As you can see behind me, today we're in the Grand Canyon in Arizona and I'm excited to introduce my new friend, Laurel Briarly. Hi, Ari. Hello. It's good to see you. Nice to see you too. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Ranger Laurel has been here for a couple years and she's going to tell her story. But as you listen today, just look at where we are. Just this majestic, in fact, last night when I was blogging, I just couldn't find enough words to express how amazing this is. So, Laurel, thank you so much for letting us be here today. My pleasure, welcome. Your backyard is gorgeous. <laughs> thank you, yeah. we do what we can. <laughs> so, Laurel, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to um, live here at the Grand Canyon. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, this is my third season here at Grand Canyon, so every summer I get to come out here and it is such a thrill. Um, I've been a ranger in uniform for five years now. So, my first two years I was at Governor's Island National Monument in New York Harbor, and that was wonderful in a very different way. Coming here was definitely different. There was a very different landscape. Um, but honestly, the people are actually very similar in terms of what we encounter. A lot of international visitors, a lot of Americans coming to find their parks. And that's something that we're very happy to be able to help them do. My background is actually in history. So coming to a geology park was a very big challenge for me and a big right. change. I have a bachelor's of science in history from Carnegie Mellon University. And I have a master's in history also from Northeastern University in Boston. And I also have a PhD PhD in museum studies from the University of Leicester in the UK. So moving around is not super new to me, um, but definitely studying rocks and figuring out the Earth's history was something that was new and a, and a big stretch coming here. Well, it's so interesting, especially for our students that are watching today that are historians that love history. They love the humanities. Yeah. And you also have this other part of you that's very exciting. So when you're not here seasonally, yeah. what are you doing? So I do a lot of acting on Long Island in New York. Um, I do some acting with an education theater company there and I really love being able to present information in theatrical ways I feel like it's a it's an extra special way to emotionally connect with the students um, and it's something that I bring here as well to Grand Canyon we do a lot of living history here and the history the human history at Grand Canyon is something people visitors aren't always expecting to find when they come here you're expecting to see this view you're expecting to learn about the Earth's history but there have a lot of been there have been a lot of people who, who helped create the history here and thousands of years of human history before this evening even became a national park. Well, we know the kids can do a lot of research on the geological features of the park. Yeah. But tell us a little bit about the history. Absolutely. So as a national park, we are celebrating our centennial. It's our 100th birthday here Happy at Grand birthday. Canyon. Thank you. We're very excited. We think that the rocks are probably laughing at us that we're very excited about a mere 100 years because they are much, much older than that. Um, but people have been coming to visit Grand Canyon uh, as a vacation really in different ways for about the last 150 years. Um, but in terms of people living here at Grand Canyon and having ancestral connections to the land that goes back tens of thousands of years and it's a really exciting thing to be able to tell visitors about when they come here. We have our uh, Grand Canyon Village which shows a lot about our pioneer history but the further out east you go or to the surrounding communities the, the more you start to learn about how important this place is to so many people. Over there. So you know I love this history but I also want to know a little bit about the science because I'm a scientist at heart and our kids are probably interested in just how big is the Grand Canyon and maybe a little bit about the geology of the park. Sure, so our canyon is huge. <laughs> from where we're standing right now over to the north rim, it's about 10 miles across from rim to rim, which is a pretty long distance. Our eyes are working very hard when we look from rim to rim. And in terms of length, the canyon is 277 river miles long. So it follows the Colorado River for 277 77 miles, so very long canyon as well. And it is one whole mile deep. From where we are right now, we are about three miles from the river. Um, and yeah, a whole mile down in terms of elevation from there. So where we are right now, we're at 7,000 feet over on the north rim, they have about another thousand feet on us. They're at about 8,000 over there. So it's a little bit further from them down to the river. They have a little over a mile, but the river is just around 2,000 feet down there. And uh, yeah, a very, very strong river. And that's actually what carved the canyon. So where we are right now, the layer of rock we're standing on is called our Kaibab limestone. And it was actually formed when there was a very shallow saltwater sea here okay. at Grand Canyon. Um, and I've just said we're at 7,000 feet. Seas don't usually happen at 7,000 feet. They usually happen at sea level. So there was a giant uplift that happened here after all of these rock layers were deposited. Down at the bottom of the canyon, we have rocks that are almost 2 billion years old, so very, very old. And they get younger as we get higher and higher, as they were deposited kind of in order. You know, when you're making a plate of pancakes, every time you flip one over when it's done, they get the younger and younger ones on top. It's just like that with our rock layers here. 
So once all of those rock layers got put in place, we had this uplift that brought us up here to 7,000 feet, and then the river started cutting down. The river has had a lot of different shapes over the years, but the Colorado River that we have in place now has been in its current course for about the last five million years. So cutting down pretty pretty slowly but doing quite a long job here getting all the way down to, to the elevation where that is now. We also have a lot of erosion here from our monsoon seasons and our cold winters where we do have a lot of snow even though we are in the desert. We're at a very high desert altitude here. So a lot of that erosion happened off the sides of the canyon as well kind of creating that nice depth that we have here. So the geology is basically very simply put as all of this rock got put here we got lifted up to the elevation we're at now the river cut down and then the sides kind of fell over time with erosion from the rains. Well, do you have a special historical figure or someone that you really like to talk about? I spent a lot of time in the park talking about a lady named Ada Bass. Um, her maiden name was Ada Dyfendorf, and she moved out here also from New York, so we have a little bit in common there. She was a musician back home. She did a lot of teaching uh, music lessons and piano. She had studied in Boston as well. But she moved out here in the late 1800s because her parents wanted her to find a husband. She was nice. unmarried in New York. She was a spinster. She was all washed up. There was nothing for her. Her there and they sent her out to see if she couldn't find somebody to marry so she came out um, and she met one of our guides here William Wallace Bass and he kind of charmed her quite a bit and she was about 20 years younger than he was but she left that New York life and moved out here and she kind of had a pretty challenging life out here she worked very hard and they would bring visitors up from the trains and Prescott and Williams all those places down south of us um, and put them up in their home so there were no big hotels there was no exciting Jeep packages to, to ride along the rim with they would take people out on foot down into the canyon and lots of times she was left to entertain and cook and clean and take care of their children so she she worked really hard out here to make sure that visitors felt welcome and taken care of and so that she could make sure her family was taken care of as well she's one of my favorites well thanks for mentioning the the females first yes. because we <laughs> put a lot of emphasis on that but can you give us a little shout out to a fella here that yeah. was important? Well, John, Captain John Hance was also another one of those early guides, and he's very famous for being the biggest liar in Arizona. <laughs> when he was out here guiding trail groups around, he would tell tall tales the whole time he took them out into the canyon. And it was the way he gained popularity. People would come from all over the world, all over the country, just to hear his lies. And he would tell stories about how he had dug the Grand Canyon while he was chasing squirrels, and how he had made his way up here to Grand Canyon on the back of the bison. And all of these crazy stories that of course were not true but were very entertaining and Theodore Roosevelt actually loved to come and hang out with Captain John Hanson and have him be his guide while he was here. Well we were very lucky a couple years ago we actually stayed at El Tovar oh, wonderful. and we stayed in one of the rooms that Teddy Roosevelt yes. actually stayed in so mm -hmm. that was exciting. Yeah. So we know the history is really important here. What is something else about this park that's special to you? You've been here a couple years yeah. so you have to have something that just kind of oh, gets you excited. The ecology here is amazing as well. We have our California condor population that we're still rehabilitating and if you're very very lucky and you're here on the right day at the right time you can see them soaring overhead. They are incredible birds. They have nine and a half foot wingspan so they're bigger than most other birds you're gonna see. Um, we have a lot of them tagged so that we can keep track of them and, and know where they are and make sure they're taken care of. In the 1980s there were only about 12 of those guys left so they were taken into captivity and, and rehabilitated there and then little by little we've been re-releasing them into the wild and here at Grand Canyon we have a very healthy sized population and we love to be able to, to catch a glimpse of those babies. Any other animals that we might see you out here? You will <laughs> and some of them are a little bit more problematic than others. We have a lot of squirrels who cause a lot of trouble. Um, we have our big elk as well and they actually um, they they aren't natively from here they were kind of uh, brought in um, over over a very long period of time and they've really only made their way up here to the canyon for about the last 20 to 30 years they've been making their way up here so they do cause some trouble as well they have their their big antlers this time of year and and people love to kind of slow down and stop and see those guys and that's something we try to discourage because we want to keep our wildlife wild here I like that. Yeah. Now, what about anything crawling around on the ground? Do I yeah. need to worry? You don't need to worry. Yeah, for the most part, we do have things like scorpions and rattlesnakes and all those scary things. We have them down in the canyon, and I shouldn't say scary. They're not that scary. Right. They're just taking care of themselves. They're probably scary to them, too. They're probably, yeah. <laughs> um, but down in the canyon, you'll see that more often than you see it up here, and especially this time of year. It's starting to get a little bit colder. We won't see those guys too much. They like it hot down in the canyon. They like to be down there. 
So if these kids came out to the park, yeah. what would be some activities that they could participate in? Well, we have our Junior Ranger program here, like a lot of parks have. So that's a book that you can get from our Rangers, and you can work on that while you're here. And then you get our really fun Centennial Junior Ranger badge, which is a nice wooden one. And we also have a lot of programming that's specifically for kids. So we have our geology programs, our critter chats, um, a lot of that stuff that, that is more kind of focused on getting kids involved and educated about the different things we have here. If they came with families, what are the ways to get down there? Yeah, Besides, so, we don't want to climb over the side. <laughs> right, yes, climbing down over the side is not recommended. But we have a number of trails that you can go down and the rangers are super happy to help you figure out how best to do that when you're here to visit. Um, down in the canyon, we have a place called Indian Garden, which is uh, about four and a half miles down. That's a really nice place if you're going to spend a whole day hiking. When it's on the hotter side, that's a good place to head to for the day. Get down there, hang out in the creek, in the shade, talk to the rangers down there. And then at the very bottom of the canyon is Phantom Ranch, and that is a lot more challenging to get down to. We really recommend being very careful with that um, in our summer months. So no McDonald's or anything down there? Unfortunately, no fast food at the moment. There is a cantina down at Phantom Ranch, but, but you're not going to get those same french fries down there. So if we are going to do some hiking here, what would be some things we need to take care of before we get out yeah, there. Yeah, so you need to make sure you have good shoes, nice hiking boots first of all, and you need to carry a lot of water. We usually recommend having a liter per person per hour with you, not necessarily to drink that much, but just in case you, you need to take a little bit more time than you anticipated. We also recommend eating a lot of salty snacks here at Grand Canyon. Hikers usually will have their protein bars and, and a lot of water, but not a lot of salt. And here you end up sweating so much of your salt out, you need to put that salt back in so that your body can keep digesting that water and you can stay nice and comfortable. So lots of water, lots of salty snacks. About how many people visit here a year? We have about six million visitors a year here, so a lot. <laughs> we every single day have, have thousands of people come through our visitor center. Are there any times in the Grand Canyon where we don't have as many visitors? We have different kind of uh, areas visit the canyon at different times. So we have, right now is a nice kind of slow time for us. The rangers are kind of catching our breath after our very busy summer season. Um, and, and really this is kind of one of the main lulls. After this we have a lot of holiday traffic and then there's spring break and then all summer long we have a pretty constant stream. Well you talked a little bit about the animals here yeah. so we want to give our engineering challenge to our students. So there are camping areas here there where you are. can actually camp mm -hmm. um, in tents. Yes. All right. So if you're in an RV, it would make more sense that you could put your food inside of your RV. Absolutely. And you can put things in your car. But the challenge I'm going to issue to our students is to design a prototype of a food container that you could use that would keep animals out. Um, keep the food fresh and also keep the smell from coming outside because that's what draws them, right? Yeah, our animals now, they do know that people have food at the campsites and it's not, we're not an area that has bears or any kind of wildlife that's going to really super endanger the campers, but it's not good for them to know that campers have food. The more reliant they become on people, the less wild they are. And again, wildlife should be wild. Right, so in Yellowstone, we're very worried about the food out because we want to protect the people, yeah. but here we really want to protect the animals. So again, design a prototype of some type of food container that we can use. We will send some of those examples to Ranger Laurel and she can share those around. But that will be our um, engineering challenge. Remember to tag those at hashtag Nat Park Challenge and you can also tag me at, at Dacia92 and I will make sure that Laurel sees those. So Laurel, we've been doing this for about a year and our students are getting very inspired by the parks. Wonderful. Not all of them can make it out to parks, sure. but I'm encouraging them to visit state parks, yeah. things around their area. But if they wanted to come and take your job, yeah. right? <laughs> what would be some things they could do right now um, in their classroom, in their community to get ready for that? One of the main things that we take a lot of pride in is protecting our planet and taking good care of our natural resources. So one of the easiest things you can do is, is whatever you can do to do that. Recycling is always a great way to get started. And then rangers love to learn. So just learn. Just start getting your hands on any information you can about what interests you. You don't have to have a specific background to come and work for the Park Service. You just have to be enthusiastic and love our parks and, and love our resources. So to be a ranger, they would need a 
four-year degree, right? A in bachelor's some cases, degrees? yeah. There are other um, other kind of uh, jobs you can get hired for. So you can be a part guide before you have a four-year degree. And a lot of our rangers get started as part guides first. Um, so that's if that's something that interests you, I would definitely recommend looking into how you can get started and which jobs are available to you at whatever point you're at and go from there. And also, guys, the park maintenance is such an important job of all of our national parks. But we have to have people that take care of this place oh, yeah. for us when we don't do a good job ourselves. It's so true. without them, I mean, nothing's going to run. No, right? and that's a great team that we have here that take really good care of, of everything you're going to see when you arrive from absolutely everything. They take really good care of this place. So thanks again for joining us today with the National Parks Expedition Challenge. This is Dr. Drizzle, out.